welcome or welcome back my peeps and geese in today's video we're going to be talking about charles manson as always grab a snack turn off the lights let's get into it <laughs> March 21st, 1997, a 32-year-old career criminal named Charles Manson got paroled from McNeville Island Prison in Washington State after doing seven years for transporting women across state lines for the purpose of prostitution and forging checks. He had already spent most of his life in government custody, from orphanage, farm school, jail, to probation. He was twice divorced, father of two, abandoned sons, a student of Scientology, a pimp, a car thief, and an amateur guitarist. On April 1967, Charles met Mary Burner, who was a librarian at Berkeley, and was the first of his quote-unquote family recruits. He also moved in with her at the time. On May 1967, he picked up 18-year-old Lynette farm at Venice Beach and brought her back to Mary's place. He also met Ruth Ann Morehouse when her father Dean picked him up hitchhiking and brought him over for dinner. She ended up running off with Charles, but she was underage. When the cops busted him, he said that his occupation was a minister. In summer 1967, 19-year-old Patricia Krenwinkel and 20-year-old Suzanne Atkins, who met Charles in the Height Asbury District while he was playing his guitar, Mary was also pregnant at this time. In fall 1967, Charles packed up the ladies he had met into a Volkswagen minibus and moved to LA. He tried to make connections in the music world and offered his girls as bait to lure in promising males. They would wander around LA and Topanga and would scavenge for food from dumpsters. Charles would get his first record company edition, which was a three-hour session, but he did not get signed. At this time, Suzanne became pregnant. On March 1968, Mary had given birth to a son that Charles named Valentine after a hero of Stranger in a Strange Land. A couple of the girls had met Dennis Wilson, of the Beach Boys, who had picked them up hitchhiking on the Sunset Strip. Charles and the girls then moved in with Dennis and May met L.A. teasers like producer Terry Melcher. In summer 1968, Charles had done more studio sessions hoping for a record deal with the Beach Boys label. Brian Wilson was apparently not impressed. The family, now with a couple dozen people, moved to the Sven Ranch, which was a movie set owned by the elderly George Sven, whose sex sessions with Lynette gave her the nickname Squeaky. On September 1968, the Beach Boys recorded Manson's song, Cease to Exist, which Dennis had revised and retitled to Never Learn Not to Love for the next album, 2020. It came out in December as the B-side to Bluebirds Over the Mountain, which would peak on the charts at number 61. On March 1969, angry at Terry's failure to deliver a record contract, Charles went to his house on Cielo Drive, unaware that Terry had already moved out. He showed up in the middle of a party that was thrown by one of the new residents, Sharon Tate. On July 1st, 1969, Tex Watson, while living at the ranch, had set up a drug burn. He made a deal to sell 25 kilos of pot that he didn't have and hustled 2500 out of a black dealer named Bernard Pua Crow. He took the money and ran. When Bernard demanded the money back, Charles had arranged a meeting at Bernard's apartment and shot him in the chest. On July 25th, Bobby Bissoy, a friend of Charles, got burned in another drug deal gone bad, but this involved Gary Hinman and a biker gang called the Straight Satans. Burned for a thousand dollars, Bobby went to Gary's home with a handgun, a knife, and a few family accomplices, Atkins, Burner, Bryce Davis, and Charles, who had cut off Gary's ear. After Bobby shot him dead, Atkins wrote political piggy on the wall in Gary's blood. On August 6th, after the police had found Gary's body, Bobby tried to make a getaway in Gary's car. When the police caught him on the highway, they also found a bloody knife hidden in the tire well. He was booked for Gary's murder. On August 9th, the Tate murders at Celio Drive. August 10th, the Lebranca murders at Wibbly Drive. On August 16th, the cops raid the ranch to look for stolen doom buggies. Charges were dropped a couple days later. The LAPD continued to treat Celio and Wibbling killings as unrelated. On August 25th, Span Ranch foreman Shorty C. was murdered. On August 10th and 12th, the police returned to the ranch, arresting 27 people for car theft. Charles was booked under the name Manson Charles M., a.k.a. Jesus Christ God. On November, Atkins boasted about the killings to fellow prisoners, who would turn her in, providing the first big break into the case. Danny DiCarlo from the Straight Saints talked to the police. Vincent Bugalosi, an LA Deputy District Attorney, took over as prosecutor. Back home in Texas, Watson surrendered to the local sheriff, who was his cousin. He stayed in Texas for almost a year. On December 4th, Suzanne Atkins agreed to cooperate and make a deal with prosecutors. Her attorney negotiated a lucrative book contract. Over the following days, her grand jury testimony made it into the newspaper. On December 19th, Life magazine did a cover story on Charles. 
just in time for Christmas, which gave him his first nationwide priority. Life presented the prosecution's version of the murders, introducing America to the official story of Charles Manson and Helter Skelter. In July, the trial began. A media circus with Manson, Atkins, Von Houten, and Krenwinkel acting up in court together. Charles carved an X into his forehead, announcing, quote, I have X myself in the world. No man or lawyer is speaking for me, end quote. The three girls also carved X's on their foreheads. On August 3rd, President Nixon brought up Charles while giving a speech in Denver, complaining that liberal media is trying to, quote, unquote, glorify Charles and other criminals. He said, quote, here is a man who is guilty directly or indirectly, of eight murders without reason, end quote. Prosecutors hoped to keep the jury from finding out to avoid a mistrial, but in court, Charles flashed them a copy of the Los Angeles Times headline, quote, Mason guilty, Nixon declares, end quote. The next day, Charles waves his own sign that said, quote, Nixon guilty, end quote. On January 25th, 1971, Charles was convicted of first-degree murder for directing the deaths of the Take La Bank victims. He was sentenced to death, but this was automatically commuted to life in prison after California Supreme Court and validated all death sentences prior to 1972. This has been the case of Charles Manson. I hope you guys enjoyed. As always, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>